Okay, so welcome to this morning's uh, plenary session. Um, I'm just chairing, don't worry, I'm not going to talk. Uh, but I'm here really, we were just talking when we first met, Nick and I, and it, we met in another century. <laughs> Sounds great. And these, these kids at the back, look at them. What's he talking about? 1998, we met in Banff, Canada at the Western Literature Association. My first meeting, Nick had been going there for some time. Um, so it's kind of interesting when you can say you've known someone across two centuries. <laughs> So I'm very proud and honoured to introduce Nick Witchie, uh, who is Associate Dean in the, the College of Arts and Sciences and a faculty member in the Department of English at Western Michigan University. Prior to his job there, he was a Fulbright Junior Lecturer in American Studies at the University of Regensburg in, in, in Germany. He's the author of The Traces of Gold, California's Natural Resources and the Claim to Realism in Western American Literature. He wrote uh, in the Western, Western Writers, Writers series a monograph on Alonzo Old Block Delano and various articles and essays on Mary Austin, John Muir, Sinclair Lewis, Henry James, Raymond Chandler, Mary Halleck Foote. He's a past uh, co-president of the Western Literature Association and he's the editor of a very fine volume called A Companion to the Literature and Culture of the American West, and also the co-editor with Melanie Growlich of Dirty Words in Deadwood, the Literature and the Post-Western. For many years, he also regularly contributed to the late 19th century literature chapter of the American Literary Scholarship and Annual. And he is currently working on a book-length study of the role played by autobiographical writings by famous gunfighters in the development of a Western as both, both a, a cultural, cultural phenomenon and a literary genre. And, and he is co-editor at the moment also of a collection of essays focused on the filmmaker Tyler Sheridan. Sheridan. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing, doing something, something for that. that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> 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 oh, that's right. Uh, so, so, sorry. sorry. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just chat. You know. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that book's coming out, I guess, in the next couple of years or so. So uh, anyway, a real pleasure. Uh, to turn the, uh, the show over to Nick. Thank you, Neil. Very much appreciated. Thank you. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, uh, particularly David Rio, um, Imaya, Amaya Ibarran, my apologies, <laughs> and, and uh, Angel Chaparro, who've been absolutely phenomenal in getting this organized, and all the big details and the little details, getting it all straightened out, and I'm just honored and delighted to be here. This is a magnificent place, and I thank you for attending. Um, this is part of a project that stems from what is seems perennially and perpetually to be my interest, which is in, I'm continuously interested in what one might call the realism effect. Um, of certain discourses, especially widely and wildly popular discourses that don't always receive full attention for their cultural work. And I recognize cultural work might be a bit of an outdated term, but it still proves useful to me. And so this is the sort of work that I'm trying to do in, in understanding what these discourses achieve in how we then think about what it is that's being talked about. Um, at the very end of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, the narrator, Nick Carraway, describes his meeting with Jay Gatsby's father, particularly the things he learns about his friend's early years when he was known as Jimmy Gatz. The father shows Nick a tattered copy of Hopalong Cassidy that his son had owned as a boy, and on one of the blank fly leaves of this book, Jimmy had written out a detailed daily schedule. Dumbbell exercise, 6.15 to 6.30, work 8.30 to 4.30, practice elocution, poise, 5 to 6 and a set of personal goals, save $3 each week, be better to parents. In its combination of daily order and aphoristic self-improvement, the program set, in the, set out in the back of this book is highly, highly reminiscent of ideas similarly rendered by Benjamin Franklin in his widely read autobiographical and pseudo-autobiographical writings. From a strictly chronological view, Fitzgerald's inclusion of Hopalong Cassidy is plainly anachronistic. Published in 1910, it simply could not have been a book that a young Gatsby could have owned and read for the schedule he wrote in the back is dated 12 September 1906. 
It thus stands to reason that Fitzgerald's choice of historical texts is designed to highlight the influence not simply of popular boys' fiction, the tales of Mark Twain or Horatio Alger might have been more historically accurate, but rather specifically that the Wild West in the making of a young man's identity, the role of the Wild West in the making of a young man's identity, which is to say, in general terms, Fitzgerald's brief scene between a first-person narrator and a title character's father, a scene with there's both Ben Franklin and Hopalong Cassidy, acknowledges two key features of uh, American literary life, if you will. The importance of the autobiographical form and the influence of genre stories about the Wild West. A quick word about terminology. When I say Wild West, I refer in large parts to a geography of myth and fantasy, to the land of cowboy cliches where Indians are on the brink of vanishing, where a real man is soft-spoken yet naturally intuitive, decisive in action, and not afraid of the appropriate use of deadly force, and where every woman is either a dance hall floozy or a virtuous school marm bringing the finer aspects of civilization to the wilderness. This West is very much unlike the Western half of the United States, which has a complex history of alternately clashing and cooperating cultures, a largely arid environment, and bourgeois and working class social structures that are for the most part consistent with those found in other regions at the time. There are, of course, plenty of cultural and historical connections. I realize I should have been doing that. There we go. Um, there are, plenty, of course, plenty of cultural and historical connections between the two, this, this Wild West of fantasy and the region of the Western half of the United States. Um, but one is well advised to tread lightly when it comes to reading the American West through the lens of regenerative, regenerative violence. Robert Dykstra is one of several recent scholars to take issue with the idea that the frontier West was a lawless, violent place that inevitably required the intervention of what Joseph Rosa romantically called a two-gun Galahad, the gunfighter. For one, Dykstra points out that according to the Oxford English Dictionary, gunslinger and gunfighter are not to be found in the newspapers of the 1870s. That's it. Gunslinger and gunfighter are not to be found in newspapers of the 1870s and 1880s, in biographies and reminiscences. Instead, the terms were invented by late 19th century fiction writers whose words have since been projected back to the frontier period. Gunfighter comes from 1894. Gunfight, 1898. Gunman, in the Western context, emerges first in 1903. Gunslinger is, strictly speaking, a philological latecomer dating from 1953. Through careful analysis of crime statistics and probabilities in a number of Western locales that were famous for their apparent lawlessness and high body count, Dykstra demonstrates that despite all the mythologizing, violent fatalities in the Old West tended to be rather rare than common. He concludes, does it mean it was a wholesome, tranquil place? Probably not but it was clearly a safer and one heck of a lot saner West than ever dreamt of in our national imagination. But who has ever paid attention to sanity when national imagination is at issue? As David Murdoch so cogently puts it, to make an itinerant agricultural worker an epic hero was to create a cultural curiosity. Then to insist that this hero have the maturity of a retarded teenager, the moral outlook of a Sunday school teacher, and the skills of an assassin was bizarre. The power of myth, however, has little to do with reason. The interesting thing about the gunfighter mythos is that it is not merely a construction applied from without. As an, ins as an instance of cultural fashioning, it frequently compelled engagement from those who were the subjects of the mythologizing. It frequently compelled it, the historical personages who found themselves, willingly or otherwise, the products of fantasizing and hype. Consider the example of the Civil War veteran and scout James Butler Hickok, who in 1867 was profiled in Harper's Magazine and thus became arguably the first bona fide Wild West celebrity. Case could be made for Kit Carson before the war areas too. Um, on the one hand, quite a few accounts depict Wild Bill Hickok as he became known as a reluctant and even resistant figure in the face of his celebrity. Yet he did consent to performing as himself on stage, and by some reports was, quote, a voluble plainsman who eagerly fed journalists, quote, a deluge of romance in an effort to further enhance his fame. 
In the passage from Dijkstra that I cited moments ago, he observed that the term gunfighter did not appear in the autobiograph autobiographies and reminiscences of the 1870s and 1880s. But absence of a term does not necessarily mean that the concept did not exist. Dijkstra is nevertheless correct in looking to memoirs for evidence of engagement with the burgeoning Wild West mythology, for autobiographical productions of all sorts from this period struggled on multiple levels with the meaning, import, and consequences of the mythic frontier for regional and personal identity alike. Indeed, as the essays plus published by Joya Woods and Kathleen Boardman in their 2004 collection Western Subjects clearly attest, the autobiographical mode has proven indispensable in the articulation of a myth of the West, both mythic and historical. In the 19th century, biography was, as Scott Casper puts it, not simply a genre of writing. He writes, in an age before television and radio, it was the medium that allowed people to learn about public figures and peer into the lives of strangers. Biographers and critics and readers alike believed that biography had power, the power to shape individuals' lives and character and to help define America's national character. And as Anne Fabian has demonstrated, the turn to autobiography as a means of self-articulation and of participating in a rap of participation in a rapidly expanding middle class economies of the 19th century was not restricted to the privileged and powerful who had access to major publishers. Describing the narratives produced by, quote, beggars, convicts, slaves, and soldiers, Fabian observes, observes that although the initial intentions of most poor and unschooled writers are frequently local, their publications have a greater reach. Personal narratives offer a popular version of the American past a key both to our myths about ourselves, stories for a culture fabricated from the lives of so many freestanding individuals, and to our national literature. All four author types of Fabian's so-called poor sufferers can be found writing about and in the post-Civil War frontier, in media that range from newspaper epistles and magazine features to self-published pamphlets, cheap dime novels, and books both big and small about the West, most of them autobiographical in nature. This then is a study of the role that literary expression, high, low, and everything in between, played in the crafting of an imaginative yet but defining idea of the American West. Beginning roughly at the end of the 1870s and continuing for the next three decades, a good many Western figures stoked the flames of celebrity by publishing memoirs about their experiences in the so-called Wild West. The roster of self-promoting gunslingers includes now such famous, such now legendary names such as Buffalo Bill, Calamity Jane, Jesse James, Cole Younger, Pat Garrett, Tom Horn, Pat Masterson, John Wesley Harden, and Wyatt Earp, all of whom wrote or had ghost written about them accounts of themselves that were published in a variety of forms. Their deliberate mixture of truth validated through firsthand experience with obviously sensational elements of blood and thunder provided a key authenticating link in the popular imagination between fantasies of the frontier and his historical realities, as well as a bridge between the dime novel and the 20th century Western of fiction and film. I hope with today's talk to suggest that the gunfighter memoir was an important and distinct genre, a cultural phenomenon that contributed greatly to the making of the American West as it was and still is popularly imagined. Back to Fitzgerald, briefly. Consider another classic American author who exploited both the West and the autobiographical form, Mark Twain. His best known novel, of course, quite eloquently exploits the conventions of autobiography, employing a first person narrator who is himself at times ironically unaware of the full import of his, of his own tale. But Huckleberry Finn was hardly Twain's first experiment in this mode. Samuel Clemens first crafted his persona as Mark Twain in letters he wrote for newspapers in California, many of which were collected in his first and most successful book, Innocence Abroad. His second book, Roughing It, from 1872, also tells a first-person story, one that is largely based on Clemens' experiences of living in the frontier regions of Nevada and California during the Civil War years of the 1860s. And while Twain himself is anything but a gun-wielding outlaw, as he confronts both fantasy and reality about the frontier, he does provide a lengthy introduction to an already legendary figure known as Slade. At first, Twain can only report in sensational terms what he has learned about through word of mouth. 
we had gradually come to have a realizing sense of the fact that Slade was a man whose heart and hands and soul were steeped in the blood of offenders against his dignity. A man who awfully avenged all injuries, affront, insults, or slights of whatever kind. A man whose hates tortured him day and night till vengeance appeased it. And not an ordinary vengeance either, but his enemy's absolute death, nothing less. A high and efficient servant of the Overland, that's the stagecoach company he worked for, an outlaw among outlaws, and yet their relentless scourge. Slade was at once the most bloody, the most dangerous, and the most valuable citizen that inhabited the savage fastnesses of the mountains. After an encounter with Slade, at which the two men share breakfast during a stagecoach stop, Twain's impressions shift, although his sensationalistic tone abates only a little. Here was romance, and I sitting face to face with it, looking upon it, touching it, hobnobbing with it, as it were. Here, right by my side, was the actual ogre who, in fights and brawls in various ways, had taken the lives of 26 human beings, or all men lied about him. He, he was, was so, so friendly, friendly and so gentle-spoken gentle that I warned him, him in spite of his awful, awful warmth to him in spite of his awful history. history. It was hardly possible to realize that this pleasant person was the pitiless scourge of the outlaws, the raw head and bloody bones the nursing mothers of the mountains terrified their children with. We, we should, should recognize, recognize here the trope of the gentleman, gentleman gunfighter. Indeed, Indeed despite, despite the positive impression that Slade makes in person, Twain's narrator still ends the chapter by worrying over whether he will be shot by the road agent, road agent who had kindly given up the last cup of coffee to a fellow traveler. In the next chapter, Twain relates Slade's ultimate death by hanging at the hands of a vigilance committee in Montana. In relating this information, he simply quotes several pages from what he calls a bloodthirstily interesting little book called The Vigilantes of Montana, or Popular Justice in the Rocky Mountains Being a Correct and Impartial Narrative of the Chase, Capture, Trial, and Execution of Henry Plummer's Road Agent Bands, together with accounts of the lives and crimes of the many robbers and desperados, the whole being interspersed with sketches of life in the mining camps of the Far West by Thomas J. Dimsdale of Virginia City, Montana, 1865. They don't name books like that anymore, do they? <laughs> My mention of this title serves two purposes. For one, one it alludes to the, the fact, fact that while well, Twain's narrator may have learned that a notorious outlaw of the Wild West, West was, was less, less than, than frightening than advertised, advertised, frightening than advertised he still maintains the sensational tone in which Slade's reputation had first been communicated, the tone that Twain uses is the similar one that the title here clearly alludes to. And second, the verbatim rendition of several pages from this book illuminates the extent to which Twain's narrative reveals him to be a reader, that he and in effect his own book are themselves consumers of text. And of course, he can fill out pages by using someone else's book, but the, it, at the very least, we show him here as a reader of text, a consumer. The wholesale copying of pages from other writers' books was simply, as I said, one way for a publisher to increase the heft of his own offerings and perhaps to lend a touch more credibility to the title. However, it does not fail to make the following point as well. In a century that saw massive increases in literacy, in access to publishing technologies, and in the availability of books, newspapers, and magazines, those Westerners whom we might call gunslingers or gunfighters could very well be just as avid in their reading as their fellow citizens in all parts of the country. One such measure of extensive readership to be found in the texts that provided readers with the Wild West is in fact the figure of Alfred Slade. Until the advent of Billy the Kid, some 15 years later, Slade is perhaps the most frequently alluded to, quote, desperado in autobiographical encounters with the West. In addition to the books by Dimsdale and Twain, he also appears in an 1870 travel narrative by Fitzhugh Ludlow called The Heart of the Continent. In this account, Slade actually reportedly tells the narrator that he himself <coughs> intends someday to write and publish his own story. No doubt his execution by a lynch mob forestalled that ambition. He also appears in William F. Cody's 1879 autobiography, better known as Buffalo Bill, Cody claims to have worked as a Pony Express rider at a time when Slade oversaw the route through the heart of Nebraska. His impression appears to have been much less frightening than Twain's, for Cody's representations are lightheartedly laced with humor, are more lightheartedly laced with humor than Mark Twain's are. Just as importantly, though, Cody, too, is shown as a consummate consumer of texts. 
His most extensive cut and paste inclusions come from George, Colonel, Colonel George A. Custer's best-selling frontier autobiography, My Life on the Plains. And please don't fail to notice that the same publisher issued Cody's and Twain's first-person accounts in the West, evident in the reuse of images. Same publisher, same picture, different text. Charlie Syringo, a ranch worker in the 1870s who later became a Pinkerton detective, an author, and a consultant in early Hollywood, provides perhaps the clearest example of the extensive reach of textual consumption in the frontier West. At the beginning of his first book, A Texas Cowboy, he tells a story about how he and his fellow laborers decide to spend money they had collected through a self-disciplined system of assessing fines for spitting and the use of improper language. Their solution, a subscription to one kind of ennobling periodical or another. And he writes here, there being two young Texans present who could neither read nor write, we let them speak their choice after the rest of us got our votes deposited. At the word given them to cut loose, they both yelled, police gazette. And one asking why they voted for that wicked sheet, they both replied as though with one voice, because we can read the pictures. We found on counting the votes that the Police Gazette had won, so it was subscribed for. I don't know if you've ever seen the Police Gazette. It was printed on garishly pink paper, and it was at, time, at the time perhaps the nation's leading purveyor of sensational news. That it proved popular no, not, not only with two illiterate cowboys from Texas, but with a majority of Syringo's crew demonstrates the extent of this appeal. One particularly widespread mode of autobiography that is a text which asserts this is who I am and why I do what I do, was the letter written to and published in the newspaper. Among his peers, Jesse James was perhaps both the most prolific reader of newspapers and the best at utilizing the letter to the editor for his own purposes. Not surprisingly, most of the letters he wrote to various regional papers all begin with the same rhetorical move. In 1871, he wrote to the Kansas City Times, I have just seen an article in the Lexington Register copied from the Caldwell Sentinel charging myself and my brother Frank with robbing a bank in Iowa of $70,000. And as I believe the editors of the Kansas City Times to be honest men and inclined to do justice to everyone, I've concluded to drop a few lines to them for publication. Similarly, in 1872, a letter to the same paper begins, I have just read an article in the Independence Herald charging Frank and myself with robbing the ticket office at the Kansas City Exposition Grounds. This charge is baseless and without foundation. And on 5 July 1875, letter to the Nashville Banner begins, as my attention has been called recently to the notice of several sensational pieces copied from the Nashville Union and Americans stating that the James and Youngers are in Kentucky. I ask space in your valuable paper to say a few words in my defense. In this letter, James also promises, I will give you a true history of the lives of the James and Younger Boys to the banner in the future, or rather a sketch of our lives. Probably I have written too much and probably not enough, but I hope to write much more to the banner in the future. This last letter even prompted an editorial response from the New York Times. Needless to say, James wrote back, promising again to write up his life for the paper as soon as I get time, end quote. And this, our, this response from the New York Times is basically a sort of a give me a break kind of piece. Um, at one point in his career, Jesse James begins to arrive to discover the dilemma in his written work. How to benefit from the reputation he has earned through his crimes while denying that he ever committed them. <laughs> and for those of you who might remember something from an earlier era, O.J. Simpson once published a book called I think either I didn't do it or how I, sh how I would have done it or something. If I did it, if I did it yeah. <laughs> so again, nothing new. The dilemma of, of uh, benefiting from his reputation while denying that he ever committed them, these crimes. James nicely walks this line on a number of occasions. In one instance, alluding to those who have allegedly slandered James by committing egregious crimes and then blaming them on him in subsequent newspaper pieces, Jesse writes in a private letter, there is no doubt but they are fixing to rob a bank or a railroad. I will show them how it is to rob on my credit. I am having them hunted with vengeance. Governor Hardin is fully posted and is working to get 
Another letter to a newspaper issued a not so thinly veiled threats to the specific lawman hunting them. Quote, as for shooting, he doesn't know what that means. Which is to say, the Jesse James was apparently a blameless in crime, presumably does know what it means. In late 1879, in late 1879, the Kansas City Evening Star received a letter reportedly from James in which he describes himself as having been living in California and is soon to board a steamer for Spain from where he points out he cannot be extradited. And he quotes to the star, in the future I will write the star many interesting letters and then my enemies can howl but I will be okay. And he signs it, Jesse W. James, bandit chief. <laughs> James is often thought of as a thief who targeted railroads for their predatory business practices and yet only once late in his career did he, refer a did he refer during a robbery to his actions as being anti-railroad. Rather, as T.J. Stiles admirably demonstrated in his recent biography, James's letters reveal a complex, astute political figure who, with the aid of his mentor and ostensible publicist, John Edwards, editor of the Kansas City Times, usually sought to present himself as a noble Southern Democrat dedicated to redressing the economic and social wrongs inflicted upon the South in the wake of the Civil War. However, by signing a letter to the editor, James w. Jesse W. James, bandit chief, James demonstrates an awareness of his reputation and desire to begin to exploit it. It is also at this time that he actually turns his attention to robbing railroads. Another apparently avid reader of his own newspaper coverage was Henry, Henry McCarty, later to be known as William H. Bonney and ultimately Billy the Kid. On 12 December 1880, Billy wrote a letter to Territorial Governor Lew Wallace, who just one month ago, one month prior to that, happened to publish the novel Ben-Hur, hoping to rekindle an offer the governor had made once before for amnesty in exchange for information about the gangs currently waging a so -called, the so-called Lincoln County War. He begins with an accusation that the media might be drawing more on rival propaganda and per perhaps even genre conventions for their information than on facts. I noticed in the Las Vegas Gazette the piece which stated that Billy the Kid, the name by which I am known in the country, was the captain of a band of outlaws who hold forth at the Portales. There is no such organization in existence, so the gentleman must have drawn very heavily on his imagination. If some impartial party were to investigate this matter, they would find it far different from the impression put out by Chisholm and his tools. The governor, however, has no interest in pursuing the suggested line of inquiry, nor in renewing the amnesty he had granted Bonnie roughly 18 months earlier, for in the interim, the kid's list of crimes had grown considerably. Instead of another deal, Wallace offered a $500 reward for the kid's capture. Two weeks later, Billy the Kid found himself again in a Las Vegas jail, and from here he granted an interview to the Las Vegas Gazette, published 28 December 1880 as Interview with Billy Bonney the best known man in New Mexico. I don't blame you for writing about me as you have. You had to believe other stories, but then I don't know as anyone would believe anything good of me anyway. Several features are notable here in both the letter and in the interview, foremost among them the plaintive cry of, I've been unjustly accused. The kid also demonstrates if the interview is to be believed, a certain measure of shoulder shrugging resignation at the realization that his media generated reputation may be more persuasive than any protests he could make. Through newspapers, he has learned that the medium has in effect created a kid not entirely in his control. And then there's Harry Longbaugh, whom we know as the Sundance Kid. He received that name for spending two years in a jail in Sundance, Wyoming. Upon the arrest that sent him to this jail, he sent the following letter dated 6 September 1887 to the editor of the local newspaper, the Daily Yellowstone Journal. In your issue of the 7th, I read a very sensational and partly untrue article which places me before the public not even seconds to the notorious Jesse James. Admitting that I have done wrong and expecting to be dealt with according to the law and not by false reports from parties who should blush with shame to make them, I ask a little of your space to set my case before the public in a true light. In the first place, I have always worked for an honest living. And as you can see for yourself, the rest of this letter offers again an extensive denial of crimes allegedly committed. As autobiographical expressions, these letters to various newspapers by the likes of Jesse James, Belly the Kid, the Sundance Kid, however, have a rather limited usefulness. 
that is, while pro providing insight into how these figures thought of themselves, the context is rather limiting as we only see glimpses of self-image in relation to the crimes they had or say they had not committed. Collectively, however, they do confirm once again the extent to which newspapers and newspaper reading could set the tone for self-expression and even identity formation among a certain class of people in the American West. And in doing so, they evince a mode of engagement that presents itself as resistance to, but is nevertheless ultimately dependent on, the rhetorical excesses of the Wild West genre. Many Westerners, many Westerners found it useful not merely to respond to the media, but to enlist the help of those same newspaper writers in crafting their own genre-dependent personal narratives. In 1895, for example, example Martha, Martha Cannery gave, gave an interview to the local newspaper upon the occasion of her return for the first time in 16 years to Deadwood, Deadwood South, South Dakota. More commonly known as Calamity Jane, Cannery had in the intervening years worked in a number of professions including teamster, mail and freight delivery agent, dance hall girl, and whether that's a euphemism or not is uncertain, and frontier scout and guide. During these years, she had also become a Wild West celebrity a personage hailed both in Deadwood and throughout the nation as one of the colorful characters who first brought all American enterprise, violence, vulgarity, and civilization to a booming gold camp. And how did she get so famous? By and large, her name had been featured prominently in a series of extremely popular Deadwood Dick dime novels and just as significantly in daily and weekly newspapers. In October 1895, Jane granted an interview with the Deadwood Black Hills Daily Times, and in his lead, in his lead, the reporter who interviewed her offers, there's probably not a newspaper nor magazine published in the United States that has not printed stories about Calamity Jane and her thrilling experiences and exploits of the Western borders. In this interview, Jane even laments that, quote, she did not like newspaper notoriety because so many writers had, and here she says, faked interviews with her and written up a lot of lies. She concludes by assuring her interviewer that since her life had never been written up authentic, she might narrate the numerous incidents to some good writer sometime and have it published. Apparently, that's exactly what she tried to do. With the assistance, that, with the assistance of an impresario for a traveling circus from Cleveland, as she recounted in an autobiography published only months after her widely publicized return, my arrival in Deadwood after an absence of so many years created quite an excitement among my many friends of the past to such an extent that a vast number of the citizens who had come to Deadwood during my absence who had heard of Calamity Jane and her many adventures in former years were anxious to see me. Among the many whom I met were several gentlemen from Eastern cities who advised me to allow myself to be placed before the public in such a manner as to give the people of the Eastern cities an opportunity of seeing the woman scout who was made so famous through her daring career in the West and the Black Hill countries. Jane's eight page book falls into the category of cheaply, cheaply and locally produced pamphlet literature, a kind often derided as having had a negative influence on the perception of the Western frontier regions. The painter and writer Frederick Remington once lamented, when I began to depict the men of the plains, white and red, this Western business was new to art and we had the dread background of the dime novel to live down. Before him though, the novelist Frank Norris invaded against what he called the wretched Deadwood Dicks and Buffalo Bills of the Yellowbacks. And even earlier, Dame Shirley, also known as Louise Clapp, Clapp who wrote in California from 1851, also observed, that the men in her mining cap had in their assumptions been led astray by what she called a sickening pile of yellow covered literature. One former frontiersman who sought to put the blame on books for having inspired a less than savory attitude in the West was James Cook, who had made his living as a military scout in the Lakota country. In 1923, he published an autobiography in which he proclaimed the following. Men like Billy the Kid, who made such a record in New Mexico during the days about which I write, caused a number of weak-headed young men to try to imitate him. And the reading of trashy novels had, I think, much to do with starting young men on the wrong path. Billy the Kid had the reputation of being one of the most desperate criminals of the Southwest. Yet he was, to begin with, not a Western product, but a New York City tough. Doubtless, he had read some very yellow novels about the bandits of the West before he started on his career of crime in New Mexico. On the criminal side of things, we find Cole Younger, who rode with Jesse James and was captured in the aftermath of the gang's infamously disastrous raid on a pair of banks in Northfield, Minnesota. 
1903, Younger was released from prison and promptly published an autobiography in which he too railed against the influence of literature. On the eve of 60, I come out into the world to find a hundred or more books of greater or lesser pretensions purporting to be a history of the lives of the Younger Brothers, but which are all nothing more or less than a lot of sensational recitals, which with the Younger Brothers have never had the least association. One publishing house alone is selling 60 varieties of these books, and I venture to say that in the whole lot there could not be found six pages of truth. The stage, too, has its lurid dramas in which we are painted in devilish blackness. And just for good measure, I include the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who, while not a gunfighter, very much styles himself as a frontier figure in his autobiographical essays about ranching in the Dakotas, where he'd gone to reinvent himself after some political setbacks in New York. In the following passage, he describes waiting out a deep freeze before returning to town with a trio of thieves that he and his cowboys had tracked down and captured in the wild. They had quite a stock of books, some of a rather unexpected kind, dime novels and the inevitable history of the James brothers, a book that, together with Police Gazette, this said is to be found in the hands of every professed or putative ruffian in the West, seemed perfectly in place. But it was somewhat surprising to find that a large number of more or less drearily silly society novels, ranging from, Ui from Uidas to those of the Duchess and Augusta J. Evans, were most greedily devoured. As for me, I had brought with me Anna Karenina, and my surroundings were quite gray enough to harmonize well with Tolstoy. I do wish I had time to explore the tempting figure of cowboys greedily devouring some silly society novels, but I don't. Suffice it to say, though, that Roosevelt, too, appears to recognize that reading was a formative act at every stratum of class in the West. As a final example, I wish to direct your attention to Wyatt Earp, who was perhaps the most interesting memoirist to respond to and adopt the gunfighter discourse. If you've seen the 1993 film Tombstone, you may recall seeing Wyatt Earp, was played by uh, Kurt Russell, place in the dying Doc Holliday's hands a slim book called My Friend Doc Holliday, which er with Earp prominently identified as the author. Well, no such book exists. The deputy marshal who presided over the legendary gunfight at the OK Corral never fully bothered to write an autobiography. He was nevertheless a man of considerable fame, which was, as expected, usually rendered in the familiar conventions of the genre Western. And just as one example, I'll give you this headline composed by a reporter for the Daily News Democrat in Gunnison, Colorado, where Earp reemerged in the public eye after leaving Tombstone. And this headline is, the Earp brothers, a reporter corners these dread enemies of the Arizona Cowboys and makes them talk. No doubt prompted by media treatment such as this, Earp observed in 1925 in a letter to a friend, notoriety has been the bane of my life. I detest it, and I never have put forth any effort to check the tales that have been published in recent years of the exploits in which my brothers and I are supposed to have been the principal participants. Not one of them is correct. My friends have urged that I make this known in printed sheets. Perhaps I shall. It will correct many mythic tales. But that's to say he never put anything into print. That's not to say. The promise to tell his tale did on occasion result in at least a partial retelling. In August of 1896, Earp dictated a series of reminiscences for the Cal San Francisco Examiner newspaper. The first essay, How I Routed a Gang of Arizona Outlaws, begins with the following paragraph. It may be that the trail of blood will seem to lie too thickly over the pages that I write. If I had it in me to invent a tale, I would fain lighten the crimson stains so that it would glow no deeper than a demure pink. But half a lifetime on the frontier attunes a man's hand to the six-shooter rather than the pen, and it is lucky that I am asked only for facts, for more than facts I could not give. Notably, this piece ends with the following bracketing device. On reading it over, it seems to me that there is not only too much blood, but too much of myself in the story. However, a man gets in the habit of thinking about himself when he, spend, when he spends half a lifetime on the frontier. The too much of myself that emerges throughout this text, and by and large, is the calm figure at the center of a storm. The lawman who could disarm an outlaw without using a weapon himself, the now mythic figure of silently held rage who stands unmoving and uninjured in the middle of a hail of bullets. Quote, the skirt of my overcoat was shot to pieces on both sides, but not a bullet had touched me. What also emerges, though, is a figure keenly aware of genre conventions, of how, by 1896, the tale must inevitably be told. 
In the middle of his account, he says of the street fights by the OK Corral, as we came to the lot, they moved back and got their backs against one of the buildings. I'm going to arrest you, boys, said Virgil. For answer, their six shooters began to spit. I fired a shot which hit Tom McClary's horse and made it break away, and Doc Holliday took the opportunity to pump a charge and buckshot out of a Wells Fargo shotgun into Tom McClary, who promptly fell dead. Similarly, in narrating the aftermath of the fight, the period often were to, referred to as the vendetta, at one point, Earp describes a fight in which, quote, one of the cowboys was trying to pump some lead into me with a Winchester, which all goes to show that Earp clearly understood the rhetorical figures by which the events at the Oak K Corral were being told. In any case, Earp, or perhaps his amanuen amanuensis, Robert Chambers, the reporter at the Examiner, even makes something of a joke in referring to the textual nature of his enterprise. He says, I have described this battle with as much particularly as possible, partly because there are not many city dwellers who have more than a vague idea of what such a fight really means, and partly because I was rather curious how it would look in cold type. Yes, just like Jesse James and Calamity Jane before him, Wyatt Earp had the help of a newspaper ghostwriter who was well-versed in, in genre conventions. <laughs> However, as it is especially the case with James, the evidence clearly supports the interpretation that Earp's account of himself very much derives from himself. Consider briefly a letter written by Earp to his biographer, Stuart Lake, in 1928. Upon beginning to work with the novelist and journalist Lake to compose his As Told to autobiography, Earp learns that one of the deputies in Tombstone at the time of the gunfight, William Breckenridge, Breckenridge had just published a memoir called Hell Dorado, in which a photo of Earp is tagged with a fraudulent unauthorized copyright claim. Dear Mr. Lake, your letter came yesterday. And it sure was a surprise for me to hear that the man by the name of Newton to take the liberty to have my picture copyrighted. He can never get away with it. I have lived a great many years. In all of my life, I have never heard of such a nerve. I don't know who he is. I have never heard of him before. My attorney is out of the city and will not return until after the holidays, as he told me he could be away for three months. A man like him needs to be called down just by a bad man, as he paints me to be, and make him show what a low-down coward he is. I am not through with him. You may rest assured in that point, Mr. Lake. And the striking thing in this letter, of course, is the, I'm going to get my lawyer on him. Oh, and I'm going to shoot him down in the street late in the gunfight. <laughs> Both conventions play out at once. Erb clearly understands the genre conventions of the Western, Western and more importantly, seeks in some, in some measure, measure to benefit, benefit from, from the reputation he has earned through those conventions. conventions. His notoriety may have been born of often sensationalized newspaper accounts, but like his contemporaries, Earp, to say the least, found both good and bad in that fact. The book which prompted Earp's outrage at the poaching of a photograph, Helderado, was published in 1928 by Houghton Mifflin, a venerable publisher located in Boston, Massachusetts, and most famous for its riverside editions of fine literature. Moreover, and having served as a primary publisher for the likes of Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Henry David Thoreau, William Dean Howells, and Henry James, this firm and its immediate predecessors had certainly established its itself as what Lawrence Buell once described as the de facto publisher of the American canon. Moreover, this firm had also pioneered such ventures as the Great American's Biography series. In the 1910s and 1920s, Houghton Mifflin began publishing autobiographies by dozens of former frontier figures, among them Breckenridge, the movie actors William S. Hart and Standing Bear, a Wyoming lawman named Frank Cant Canton, who had somehow failed to disclose, disclose a criminal career he'd had under a different name, and at least three memoirists who wrote of their experiences with Billy the Kid, Charlie Syringo, John Poe, and George Coe which is to say the gunfighter memoir has by this time become a legitimate, profitable, and arguably not so lowbrow form of literary expression. And Houghton Mifflin would also publish Stuart Lake's notoriously, and some would say scandalously sensationalized biography of Wyatt Earp in 1931. So what conclusions can be drawn from all of this? For one, there existed a widespread awareness of and sensitivity to the representations found in newspapers published on and about the Western frontier. Second, we clearly see a reluctance but unmistakable efforts to engage those representations on their own terms, whether by the figures themselves or by their amanuenses. In the latter case, of course, we simply have like contributing to like. 
But most importantly, we now see a, we see a now familiar discourse beginning to evolve. The appeal of the narrative of the American West is often discussed in terms of its relevance to imperial justifications or to normalized and generally conservative gender roles or to an economically driven nostalgia that combines elements of both. There's also, however, an element throughout this discourse that insistently hearkens to the true and the real, and those are definitely in, in quotes. From nature writing to travelers and explorers accounts to the documentary photographs of the great 19th century exploration surveys, narratives of the American West have long relied upon a rhetorical appeal to veracity. Add to this legacy then the genre-inflected memoirs of figures who usually found themselves constructed by those very same genre conventions. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Nick. That was great. great. Um, so, so we have we have um, yeah, yeah we, we have, have some plenty of time for comments, questions, questions responses uh, to Nick. So um, anyone like to raise their hand? Nancy, do you have a mic? Yeah. Thank you. In my haste, this is uninformed, but I'm interested in the tension between celebrity and and generic genre conventional characterization. And and only because I've worked on it, I'm particularly interested in the example you showed of the American publishing company's practice of reusing mm -hmm. illustrations. And with Mark Twain, they were careful to create a caricature and they reuse, reuse sort of landscape images. But in the Cody, you you'd think in some sense there would be an attempt to individuate slave mm -hmm. and and create a kind of caricature, but it seems to me that those images are used kind of generically in the way that I think you're suggesting the genre conventions render caricature in tension with individuation. Can you talk a little more about that? Um, yes. <laughs> The, uh, oh, I'm gonna, pardon me as I back all the way through these slides here. I'll find a faster way to do that. I don't remember which is which. But it's distinctive that one of the images in the Cody book is actually described as Slade, whereas in the, in the Twain book it's just a, a, a division agent. That that image of the gunfighter shooting <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, I, I don't know if this quite gets. I think what we see here is is at least at the very least the caricature. The, the image has has multiple frames of utility. Because it's not in the Slade section that we see this picture in the Twain book. It's a few pages, I think, before it was described, which is generally what happens in the West. But then Cody and his editor then found it useful to actually use the picture to say, oh, this is a picture of Slade. There are actually, I think, about a half dozen images shared between the two books. This is just the one of them. Um, as far as caricature and individuation and celebrity, um, as, as uh, I think uh, Henry Wanham put it in his book on caricature some years back, um, the images are tremendously fluid and quite easily lend themselves to exactly this sort of um, double meaning. Um, I don't think anybody picked up, I wouldn't, it would be hard pressed to imagine anybody picked up Cody's book and went, hey, I didn't know that was Slade. I saw that, book, that picture a couple of years ago. Or reverse somebody knew Twain's book and went, oh, I didn't know that was Slade in the book. You know, so um, it, it speaks, I think, to the fluid utility of the images. Um, and I think that speaks more broadly to the fluid utility of the genre conventions. Um, we see, I've focused here predominantly on the, I didn't do it, but type of rhetorical piece that happens again and again with Jesse James, Billy Kidd. Um, John Wesley Harden down in Texas published a jailhouse memoir, a great big fat book. So did Tom Horn in Wyoming, um, both of whom thought they were unfairly jailed and wrote lengthy books they're recounting all their Western adventures that, that remarkably never actually resulted in any crime. Uh, <laughs> um, but the, the, the conventions are strikingly similar, and a lot of it does 
rebound back on the sort of sensational blood and thunder that we first get with Kit Carson's autobiography then becomes part of the police gazette mode. And, and the point I'm actually trying to make is that these are all people who felt or seemed constrained by the discourse that put them in a certain kind of box. And in the case of Wyatt Earp, could try to exploit it, but in other cases, we're just basically like, okay, I'm that guy. Hello? Yeah. Hello. I need more caffeine, but um, I, hopefully this will make some sense. What a great talk. Thank you so much. You learned a lot. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to the letter to the editor genre mm. that appealed to the public and how it's mediated through um, these newspaper venues because, um, you know, Sarah Winnemucca did similar things mm -hmm. uh, with her notoriety. Obviously, that was gendered and racialized. And I was also thinking about just that, um, you know, that trope in 19th century abolition slave narrative discourse, you know, the, uh, you know, this is true, this really happened to me, it's so sensational, like Harriet Jacobs and Sims Life of the Slave Girl. So I know you talked about Calamity Jane a bit, but have you, in your research, thought about the way in which these appeals, how they get mediated, specifically through gender and race, or are just, it's just mm -hmm. kind of a, like I said, a half-formed question, but I was wondering if you could speak to any of that. It, it is, is something, something I've thought about. about. Um, it is a, an angle on the project that I haven't fully developed yet um, to think about that next level of consumer of text. I've thus far focused largely on the sort of this, these primary sources as the evidence of the consumption of text. And what you're talking about is how then that gets mediated by further readings and readings of readings. I mean, the one thing I had in here was the New York Times responding to Jesse James, who ba basically describes him as being full of it. And we, we know what he's doing, and we shouldn't dignify newspapers with uh, any mention of it. And yet the New York Times, the old great lady, is doing exactly that. Um, Calamity Jane is one of, if, if I sort of think through the archive that I've constructed here of these texts, they're mostly white, mostly male. Um, the two women, and both of whom were clearly ghost-written products, are uh, Star, Bell Star and, and Calamity Jane. Calamity Jane was, was widely known, demonstrably illiterate. So she, that, that is not her telling. This is a ghost-written account, pseudo-ghost-written. Um, and so is Bell Star's. But the question of who wrote Bell Stars is a little less clear than these uh, circus empresarios who wrote uh, Calamity Janes. Um, in the case of Nat Love, it's, it's a very different sort of text because there doesn't seem to be quite the same sort of level of mediation. And, and Love is actually comes a little later in this whole course of things, but is relying very much on what the precedent has been set here. Um, by those writing about so, which is all of which is to say a very sort of weak answer to your question. This is I'm, I'm very cognizant that there are further questions to be asked along those lines, and I'm not quite there yet. But but I do mean to suggest that I, I'm keenly aware that the evidence has opened that road for me. I just haven't taken that road yet. Uh, anybody anybody else? else? Comments, questions? I just I had, had I mean, sorry. Sorry. James. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really just, just a minor, minor footnote, footnote, but um, you showed the, the striking cover art for The Great Gatsby 1925. Uh, many people may not know that was done by a Spanish artist, uh, Francis Cugat, C-U-G-A-T, um, who was the younger brother of the band leader, Xavier or Javier Cugat, yeah. And he, he painted this without having read the entire manuscript, at least according to what uh, the Scribner's publisher has, has written. So just a 
a footnote. That's excellent. Thank you for bringing that. And I'm glad you sort of bring back the Gatsby because I think I, I, in the one paragraph I devote to actually close reading of that final section, I mean, we can go on for days um, talking about the narrator, the autobiographical mode by a first person narrator from the West. He's described, Nick Carroll is described as coming from the West, albeit the West of Minnesota, not the West of Arizona, New Mexico, but he's still described as a Westerner. And of course that classic ending, the, the off celebrated ending in, in looking to the setting sun in the West and the, uh, the green breast of the new world rising out of that. It, it's the, there's so much and to wrap into that a dime novel and the autobiographical mode. That's ultimately where I try to sort of locate this. Is like, okay, we've talked about, you know, Louise Westling has a whole book titled The Green Breast of the New World, starting with the Gatsby story and moving outward from there and some eco-critical readings. Um, but uh, just Hopalong Cassidy's in there too. It's worth noting. And I'm struck by the next image, which is from the Dickerbag Rebel. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Yep, that is Clint, Clint Eastwood's hand. And Lee Van Cleef way off in the bottom here. We don't have Eli Wallach in this roundup yet. Okay, anyone else? We have little time, so if there's anyone to add anything, anything else, else? not clear the room. Okay, okay can, can I, I just, just uh, say on behalf of everyone, everyone Nick, thank, thank you for that, it's wonderful, wonderful and uh, thanks, thanks for keeping to time too, which is always good. good. And, and thank, thank you for all turning out, thank, thank you very much. much.